A lot of surprising finishes during week six of the Cruiserweight Classic. And NXT shows you exactly how to build a championship match for a pay-per-view. Let's talk about it. What is going on, guys? JD from New York here. Thank you so much for tuning back into the channel tonight. We're going to go over the Go Home Show for NXT as we head right on into NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 2, back to Brooklyn. And we're going to go over the Cruiserweight Classic Week number 6 of the 32-man single elimination tournament. Unbelievable action tonight. Can't wait to talk about it with all of you guys. But before I do that, one very important thing, actually two very important things. Number one. If you guys missed my NXT TakeOver Brooklyn preview and predictions, I did a 30-minute podcast, sit down, I went over the entire card, gave you my opinions about literally everything that's going to happen and what I think is going to happen, my thoughts and opinions behind everything going into Brooklyn and what I see coming out of Brooklyn. That went live this morning at 11 a.m. So if you guys missed that, I'll link it down in the description and I'll put an annotation on the screen in the video. You guys can go check that out. Definitely worth your time. Very informative, uh, very uh, in-depth about NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. So make sure you guys go check that out. Number two, if you guys love the WWE 2K16 stuff I've been doing on my channel as of late with the Road to WWE 2K17 King of the Ring Tournament, you guys do not want to miss the match that just took place yesterday, man. Sami Zayn versus Seth Rollins in one of the best classics you will ever see showcased in 2k60 man go and watch it i guarantee you your jaw is going to hit the floor at what happened in that match man unbelievable stuff so make sure you guys go check that out also raw and smackdown reviews this week are live but we're not going to talk about that because we don't want to get upset man everybody has calmed down i have calmed down from smackdown i've calmed down from raw we all know they were fucking miserable, horrific nightmares of shows. And Wednesday is a time for all of us to relax and just just chill and watch wrestling on Wednesday nights. No bullshit. No fucking Miz TV. No fucking bullshit added like you see on the WWE main roster. It's, it's just down to the simple basics, man. Wrestling. That's it wrestling back to the fundamentals by building hype for championship matches through facial expressions words and just a sit down intimate environment that's exactly what happens on wednesday nights we're going to go over all that we're going to start off with nxt guys and nxt you know i don't want to sound hypocritical at all you know and i don't want to come off as uh you know, me favoring NXT over the main roster, which most of the case I do, because what NXT does, you know, it, it's a take on the old school. They borrow a lot of the things and the formulas that worked back in the old school. They keep things simple, and it works. And I wish WWE on Raw and SmackDown would borrow the, some of those simple fundamentals and apply them to the main roster shows, but WWE is too thick-headed. Uh, to see that what's working in NXT is actually, it's very good, man. And I enjoy it more than anything right now. And I have been for the last couple of years. More so than anything that has been happening on Monday Night Raw and SmackDown. And what happened tonight on NXT was, there, there was a lot of promo packages. But they were new promo packages. They got you ready. They got you hyped. They, they gave you... You know, decent music behind the wrestlers talking about why NXT TakeOver is important, why Brooklyn is important, why wrestling in New York City is important, why these TakeOver shows are important and special to everybody that, that has been competing in NXT. And they went over all that. You, you've seen Andrade Cien Almas, you've seen Bobby Roode, you've seen Austin Aries, you've seen No Way Jose. You know, guys who are fresh to the NXT brand, especially Bobby Roode. You know, Austin Aries is still fresh. Uh, Andrade Cien Almas is still fresh. And No Way Jose, you know, this is going to be his first NXT TakeOver. This is a big event for him. And they were going over all that. You know, they spoke to the Revival about why Gargano and Ciampa don't deserve a tag team championship opportunity. They highlighted Bailey and Asuka, and they kept going back to what Bailey and Sasha did at last year's 
takeover Brooklyn special. And they're highlighting that this year, Bailey is more focused than ever. Bailey cut one of her best promos ever during the contract signing. You know, she's very in sync with what's going on here. She wants redemption. She wants revenge. And the most important thing to Bailey right now, no matter what is being said about her moving up to the main roster, Bailey is always going to let you know that the most important thing in her world is the NXT Women's Championship. And that's what they've been documenting over the past couple of weeks. With Asuka, she's undefeated. Nobody can beat Asuka. Nobody has been able to beat Asuka. Nobody has even come close to beat Asuka. And they're going over all that, and they're getting you ready. They're planting those seeds, those most important aspects of what has been built so far. And they're letting you know, and they put a great video package here and there together with all these different matches happening. And they put decent music behind it, and Corey Graves is letting you know how important this is. All in all, it was done differently than what WWE did for SummerSlam with Raw and SmackDown. And there was no interest. There's no hype level for SummerSlam, minus Balor and Rollins, but that's, that, that's, that's pretty much down to Balor and Rollins, because we want to see this match, we don't give a fuck if there was no build at all, we, we, we're going to want to see Balor and Rollins, regardless if there was the fucking greatest build of all time, or absolutely zero build, it doesn't matter, you know, Ambrose and Rollins, it, it's, it's okay, no, Ambrose and Rollins, not, not Ambrose, Ambrose and Ziggler, I got fucking Rollins and Balor on my head, because that's the one match I'm looking forward to, out of the entire SummerSlam pay-per-view. Ambrose and Ziggler. You know, I appreciate what they've been doing. And it, it's, it hasn't really gelled, man. I feel like the SummerSlam build came just too fast. It, it just, it, it, it was three weeks and it just came too fast, man. And I don't know if WWE wanted it to come off that way. But if you look to NXT and you see the TakeOver build... Yeah, you know, this is. It seems like it's it's had a proper build. When you look at SummerSlam, you don't see that proper build. Everything just feels rushed. Everything feels rushed on the main roster, and I don't understand why. You know, and I've been saying it, and I'm not saying that Raw and SmackDown has to be exactly with what NXT is doing, but I mean borrow some of the ideals and and the properties of NXT and apply them to the main roster. What you've seen tonight on NXT is how you build and generate hype for a pay-per-view, okay? And I, and I want to start off, before we even go over the show, because the show really wasn't anything that important, you know? The, the most important thing on this show was the fact that you had Samoa Joe and Shinsuke Nakamura in a sit-down environment, okay? You had Byron Saxton moderating this entire thing, and the imagery was just beautiful. You had William Regal there because he knows the type of character that Samoa Joe is and the fact that this guy is a loose cannon, he could snap at any time. And the simple fact that he doesn't trust Samoa Joe after what Nakamura did to him last week. And he knows he's got a short fuse and he doesn't want things to get out of hand. So he was there with several WWE officials and security and they just overlooked this entire thing as Byron Saxton sat in the middle in between Samoa Joe and Shinsuke Nakamura. Now, this was fucking awesome. I absolutely loved this entire thing. And William Regal, before they even went to commercial break, was asking Samoa Joe if he was ready for this sit-down interview. And the facial expressions on Samoa Joe were absolutely fucking laugh-out-loud hilarious. And I don't mean that as a knock on Samoa Joe, but it was hilarious because... Samoa Joe plays his character so fucking good. And you can't help but laugh. And that's what I see and that's what I feel when I watch someone who is just so in tune with their character. And he plays the character so brilliantly. He comes off as a legit tough guy. And Samoa Joe is just fucking looking back at him. Rolling his eyes. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm ready. As if he made the mannerisms. Yeah, of course I'm ready, you fucking goon. Of course I'm ready. I'm the fucking champion. Of course I'm ready, Regal. You know, he's like, what the fuck? What are you asking me I'm ready for? I'm always ready. So it was the sit-down interview. They went to commercial. We came back, and things kicked off. And Joe was saying that he had to go through the entire roster for months. This was, this was an important line here. If you guys were paying attention, Joe said he had to go through the entire roster for months to get a title shot 
But Nakamura beats Balor once, and he gets his title shot. Bailey had to ask for a rematch. And Regal, he said, had to check with Asuka to see if this match was okay. If Asuka wanted to do it. You know, how come Joe didn't get that same treatment from William Regal? He feels that Regal just gave Nakamura the title match, and that's it. He didn't ask for his opinion. He didn't consult with Joe. And Joe felt slighted. Joe felt disrespected. And I loved that line. That line made this entire sit-down segment. The fact that they brought that up and they integrated that into this, this entire situation was just brilliant. And that's how you generate hype. And that's how you keep interest. And, you know, they go back on what happened previously. And you got to appreciate that. I like that type of thing. Nobody was thinking that when, when this sit-down segment came out and, and they were doing this thing and they were going to interview both of these guys before the title match. Joe brings up that small little detail that probably went over everybody's head. The fact that, that William Regal had to go ask Asuka if it was okay to accept this match. Is it, is it going to be okay with you if I book this match between you and Bailey at TakeOver? And the fact that Joe felt disrespected, that's fucking great. That's great. That, 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 that one line, that one phrase from Samoa Joe made this entire thing. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And then Nakamura says he's a calm man by definition, especially outside of the ring. And I don't know what the fuck Nakamura was wearing. You know, he, he was wearing this plaid shirt as if he was trying to fucking imitate Kurt Cobain. I, I don't know what the fuck he was doing. He was sitting there just all, all pretty. You know, he, he wasn't doing anything. You know, he was giving his his smart, you know, facial reactions. And, uh, you know, he was being typical Nakamura. But Joe, you've seen him increasingly getting angry, angry, and more angry. Joe says Nakamura came to his dojo for training earlier in his career. And Nakamura doesn't remember it being Joe's dojo and smiles a lot. Joe respects what Nakamura has done, but maybe not Shinsuke himself. In the answer to the same question, Nakamura leans forward and smiles. And he smiles too much for, for Samoa Joe's liking, which, you know, prompts Samoa Joe to get out of his chair. And he, he pretty much says, listen, you, you want a fucking piece of me? What the fuck's going on here? You know, you're smiling, you, you, you're thinking this is a joke. And Samoa Joe, again, feels disrespected and slighted. And he wants to beat the shit out of Nakamura right there. William Regal gets up, and he has security break it up. And William Regal is ushering him, get, get, get this fucking guy out of here, just get him the fuck out of here, you know? Get this guy out of the, out of the arena, tired of this bullshit, and the camera closes on William Regal with a hugely disgusted look on his face, and that's the way they end NXT. day. Absolutely brilliant. Everything about this segment is exactly how you build a title shot. Not by going on Miz TV, clowns, okay? Not with what... Ambrose and Ziggler did on SmackDown. Give me a break. This is how you build hype. They did this same thing with Balor. It was a little bit more serious because Balor was serious. He wanted the title back. And they were billing this as, you know, the last opportunity for Balor, you know. And Nakamura was just sitting there being typical Nakamura, smiling and, you know, giving his facial expressions. His charisma was just seeping through the television. And Samoa Joe was increasingly getting angrier and angrier and angrier. And, it, and you, just see, you just seen it boil over. It was fantastic. That's how, you build a, that's how you build a title match. And I was incredibly pleased with the way NXT closed. And you know what? The most important thing about this is that Joe and Nakamura have not touched once. Not once during this entire build. You know, the only time that they touched is when Nakamura stole Joe's nose last week. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if you call that touching, but the fact that these guys did not get physical yet and that this anticipation is building. And when that bell finally rings on Saturday night at around 10 p.m., everybody's going to be fucking at the edge of their seat. That's how you build a championship match. And... I don't mean to downgrade anybody's opinion. Everybody can have an opinion. But what I've been saying is that I don't stand for stupidity. Okay? I don't understand how, if you have the WWE Network, you're not watching NXT. And you tell me that, oh, you know, why don't you just concentrate on NXT? Because, 
you know, that's that, that's that's more your cup of tea. And, and why do you watch or continue to watch Raw and SmackDown if you're not going to enjoy it? Just stop watching it. Do you understand that this is all under the same WWE umbrella? You know, th I want you guys to understand the simplistics of things here. Look at what they did on NXT. The fact that Samoa Joe and Nakamura have not even touched in three to four weeks of build for this pay-per-view, for this special event. Now look. Everybody is anticipating this match even more so than when it was first announced. You know, WWE on Monday Night Raw is giving you Roman Reigns and Rusev six days before a fucking SummerSlam pay-per-view. Give me a break. You know, Balor and Seth Rollins comes out with the demon paint, the mystique and the allure and the, and the stigma and the anticipation of Balor coming out now and seeing the demon for the first time on the main roster is gone. The fact that they butted heads and they locked up already and they, they had a few brawls here and there. Why? Why are you going to let these two guys go before the pay-per-view? It's the one thing I never understood is if you're having a huge championship match like this, why are you not keeping these two guys apart? For the sake of the pay-per-view, for the sake of the match itself, for the sake of the fucking championship and what's on the line, look at what NXT has done with Samoa Joe and Nakamura. Guarantee you, out of everybody that's going to be watching everything over SummerSlam weekend, the most anticipation is going to come from Nakamura and Samoa Joe because of these simple ideals and, and these simple ways to go about building a proper championship match. And, and that's all fact. That's all fact. There's a reason why I am so negative about the WWE main roster. It's because they don't do the things that are fundamentally sound and that need to be done. They always think that what they do is right. It's not. Most of the time, what WWE main roster does is the wrong way, is the wrong thing. You know, Road Dog, and I'm going to talk about this on Out of Nowhere, Road Dog actually defended the fact that the Intercontinental Championship was showcased during a commercial break on SmackDown. He gave the excuse that, listen, you know, I, I, I disagree with you. You know, the Intercontinental Championship needed to be on the show, and we needed to find a way to get it into the show, and you should be lucky we actually did. And that's where we fit it in. Time constraints. Really? So, you mean to tell me you're disagreeing with everybody that says the Intercontinental Championship is being disrespected because it's not being featured during the show and not on a commercial? Come on, bro. The likes of Mr. Perfect, Razor Ramon, Bret Hart... Ravishing Rick Rude, the Ultimate Warrior, so on and so forth, held that fucking title. The, 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 the prestige of that title. The people that have held that title. The fucking hands that have touched that gold and that leather strap. Now it's on The Miz, and you're presenting it during a commercial break? See, these are the things that I don't agree with. And for people to say that SmackDown was good and you overlook things like that, but then you make fun of me and watch NXT, but NXT is doing everything right to build hype, interest, and intrigue for a big-time event. Come on, bro. That's not logic to me. That's sheer stupidity. And I don't want WWE Raw to be 100% like NXT. I want them to watch what NXT does and the way they build things and the way they build hype and interest and intrigue for their championship matches and their big-time events. Every match on TakeOver feels important. Every match. Can't say the same about SummerSlam. I don't even know there's an Intercontinental Championship match taking place. I don't know. Everything underneath the top four matches, besides the championship match for the women's title, and, you know, even Roman Reigns and Rusev doesn't even feel important anymore. Anything outside those top five matches. You're going to have 11 matches during a five and a half, six hour show. It doesn't feel important. Everything just feels thrown together, and it's not like what NXT is doing. That, that's, that's my gripe. That's where I'm coming from, and I hope you guys understand that. Nakamura Joe, absolutely brilliant. If you missed it, I recommend you go out and watch what these two guys did because there's no doubt in my mind. You watch this, and you're going to be hyped for Saturday's main event. No question. Rest of NXT quickly. Hideo Itami versus Mustafa Ali. He was actually in the Cruiserweight Classic. He was actually one of the more impressive ones in the Cruiserweight Classic. So this would be two times now that Hideo Itami fought Sean Maluda and Mustafa Ali. Two times he fought people who were in the Cruiserweight Classic. I don't necessarily agree with that whatsoever, but Mustafa Ali, 
I would like to see him get a contract with the Cruiserweights for Monday Night Raw. I think he was one of the more impressive ones in round one. Hideo Tommy, I'm going to say this. I think Hideo Tommy is going to be the one to challenge Nakamura when he wins the WWE NXT Heavyweight Championship. And I think Hideo Tommy is going to be the one to challenge Nakamura coming out of that pay-per-view on Saturday. I think that's the way they're going to go. Hideo Tommy, the one thing I'm still concerned with is that the crowd is still not where it needs to be. When Hideo Tommy was there before his injury, he was he was just white hot, man. People people were fucking in love with him. They were they were getting ready for him. He was the next big thing. The year and a half layoff obviously and clearly did some damage. I just hope that WWE and NXT build this guy back up to where he needs to be because right now I'm not hearing the crowd reaction, uh, you know, compared to when when he was before his injury. That, that's my main concern here with, with Hideo Tommy. You know, he's shaking off that ring rust. He looks good. You know, I want to see more, more from him, definitely. He's definitely going to be in the, mi the main event. He's going to be a huge piece to the puzzle of NXT. I, I just hope the fans are going to be there when, Hida uh, when Hideo Tommy you know, rises to the main event scene again in NXT. That's the only thing I'm concerned about. We've seen video packages, like I said, for Bailey, Asuka. We've seen footage of Aries and No Way Jose. Rude and Almas. We have the Revival versus Gargano and Ciampa. Going to be a great fucking pay-per-view. That Tag Team Championship match is going to steal the show at TakeOver Brooklyn. I guarantee you. We had a women's match here. Carmella, Liv Morgan, and Nikki Glencross versus Alexa Bliss, Mandy Rose, and Daria Berenado. Now, this was a match that really surprised me. I, I didn't really go into this you know, expecting all too much, but I will say this, right out of the bat, right out of the gate, I should say, Mandy Rose looked like an Eva Marie clone, okay, she looked like Eva Marie 2.0, immediately I was turned off, because she looks way too Barbie dollish to be in a WWE ring, okay, Daria Baronado, she looked great, she looked like she was getting ready to fight Ronda Rousey with her getup, man, she looked like a prototypical UFC uh, women's fighter, okay, she looked great, uh, and just b based on her appearance, I think she's going to have a, a, a very bright future in WWE and NXT, Alexa Bliss, obviously, we know what she's capable of, she's come a long way, she's fucking great, and I look forward to seeing her blossom even more on SmackDown, if she's given the opportunity, Nikki Glenn, uh, Glenn Cross, uh, she was kind of, she was kind of, you know, I wouldn't say she was green. She was kind of bland and boring. Nothing really stood out about her. Liv Morgan, I, I, I like the quirky, you know, lively Liv Morgan. She's like a little firecracker. And then Carmella, you know, she didn't have a microphone in her hand, so she wasn't as cringe as she usually is. So she just came down, did her thing. Uh, nothing all that special there with Carmella. You know what you're going to expect when she is in the ring. Uh, still talented. She's getting better as well, little by little. But, you know, don't put a, uh, don't put a microphone in her hand. I just don't... Uh, I don't approve, man. It's just, it's just a little too cringe for me. But as far as this match, it went 11 minutes and 35 seconds. Uh, Mandy Rose uh, didn't nauseate me, which is surprising. You know, she uh, she moved better than Eva Marie. I, I will say this. You know, Eva Marie looks like she's fucking snorkeling for shellfish every time she's in the ring. But Mandy Rose, I mean, she was she was uh, swift. She was moving back and forth. She she threw a good elbow and a good right hand, and you know, she uh, she took a bump here and there. You know, even Marie can't even fucking land properly on the mat, so she can't do anything uh, right. So Mandy Rose coming out of fucking tough enough is already better than Eva Marie. Go figure. Everybody's better than Eva Marie. So want to let that right out of the bag. I wasn't really all that disappointed like I expected to be with Mandy Rose. So she lives to fight another day, in my honest opinion. I, I look forward to seeing a little bit more of her. Corey Graves fucking, you know, hyped her up as like the fucking greatest thing of all time. Which he was great, man. He just sounded so much like a Jesse Ventura type. Uh, normally he does, but tonight he really, he really leveled, you know, he fucking caked that shit on tonight. But as far as this match goes, I'm glad that WWE gave you four women. We know what Carmella and Alexa Bliss are, are all about. They gave us four women that we definitely want to see more of. And as of this match, and when this match was concluded, I definitely want to see more of these women. You know, it really, it really surprised me. It, it was a fun match. It really did what it needed to do, showcase the new upcoming women since everybody's being moved up to the main roster and Bailey's going to fucking be expected to move up to the main roster any week now. You know, who are you going to have down there? You're going to have Ember Moon and Asuka leading that division. After that, there really is nobody else. WWE has to get the wheels rolling fast if they want to get, 
competition in line for both Ember Moon and Asuka. Liv Morgan, Nikki Glenn Cross, Mandy Rose, still on the fence about her. I will definitely give her a chance, more so than Eve Marie, and Daria Baronado. Definitely looking forward to seeing more from all four women, and it was a definitely a fun match tonight. You had, um, what's her name, Carmella win with the Code of Silence, or the Cone of Silence. I don't know, I don't know what, what the name of her finisher is, but it's that, that leg wrap. She wraps her legs around the, the throat of her opponent, made her tap out, and that was pretty much it. Mandy Rose tapped out there. So NXT, man, pretty. it was like half build up for NXT TakeOver, and then we've seen a few matches here and there. You got 12 minutes out of the women, which wasn't bad at all. So that was pretty much NXT, man. Let's talk about the Cruiserweight Classic real fast. Great night of action for the Cruiserweights, and a lot of shocking and surprising outcomes in week number six of the CWC. Week number six of the Cruiserweight Classic. How was WWE going to follow up what they did with Ibushi and Cedric Alexander? I didn't expect them to come out and top what they did last week. I don't think they're going to top that at all, all year. But the Cruiserweight Classic Week 6, still a very fun show. Uh, a lot of surprising outcomes here, which we'll go over very fast. Jack Gallagher easily, quickly became one of my favorites in this tournament. He was going one-on-one -on -one against Akira Tozawa. This was England versus Japan. The main thing about the Cruiserweight Classic tonight, if you guys watched the first two matches, we've seen Gallagher and Tozawa, and then we've seen Ho Ho Loon versus Noam Dar, okay? The first two matches that we've seen, which there was only three on tonight's show, the two matches that we've seen to kick off the show were very submission, methodical heavy. There was a lot of submission holds, the paces were slowed down compared to what we've seen the previous weeks. I mean, especially with Gargano and Ciampa and then Kota Ibushi and Cedric Alexander. Seemed like WWE toned things down a little bit and they kept everything a little bit more mat-based in week six. Especially with Jack Gallagher being a submission specialist. You got Akira Tozawa who looks like he's going to fucking cut your throat at any given moment. He's a fucking legit beast. And then you had Ho Ho Loon and Noam Dar, which we'll talk about in a second. But I was shocked by the submission specialist himself, Jack Gallagher, man. Some of the things this guy does is just, you, you, you just look and you can't turn away. There was one instance in tonight's show where he literally turned Akira Tozawa into a fucking human pretzel. And he laid him there in the middle of the ring and Tozawa could not get up. He was, he, he, listen, if you go to fucking Auntie Anne's pretzels and you go fucking looking in the case, yeah, I'll take a fucking cheese-filled pretzel and give me some of that marinara sauce on the side. This guy looked like a fucking pretzel in a showcase window, and he couldn't fucking move, man, you know? Put some extra salt on that one, extra butter, you know? Tozawa could not get out of this pretzel-like maneuver. It's like you rolled him up into a ball. I've never seen anything like that in my fucking entire life. It was fucking hilarious, and, you know, Gallagher was having a good time with it. He was... You know, uh, you know, joking around that he was going to kick him in the ass, which he eventually did. He fucking leveled him with a huge running knee lift and a kick. But it, it was just great, man. That that differentiating style and, and that unique style of Jack Gallagher is just infectious. And just by that alone, I wanted to see him advance in this tournament, which I thought that they were going to have him advance because he's, he's an overwhelming crowd favorite. You know, everybody respects Akira Tozawa and the shit that he does and him being a fucking legit badass. But... I thought Jack Gallagher was the right man to win this match because of how over he is with the crowd. But that wasn't the case. You know, Jack Gallagher completely just decimated Akira Tozawa, uh, Tozawa's legs all through this match. And that was the focal point of this match, taking out Tozawa's legs. You know, submissions, leg wraps, leg vines, figure fours, you name it. And Gallagher did it to Tozawa's legs. You know, to the point where I thought Akira Tozawa was pretty much going to be eliminated in this tournament, and all it, all it did was take one German suplex, two actually, two German suplexes, and Akira Tozawa pulls out what I thought was an upset victory. After being beat down all match, Jack Gallagher is eliminated, and I was shocked, man. I was actually not disappointed in the match. I was disappointed heavily in the outcome. I thought Gallagher would be a great uh, addition to the Elite Eight, and he walks off a loser. And I want to see more of him in WWE. If WWE has any brain whatsoever, they would sign Gallagher. I think he has such a unique style that is infectious. 
that could easily get over. He's different. He's got a great look. He's got a great personality. And something like that, rolled up into a nice package, I could see definitely getting over on the main roster. If there's one thing that people say about these guys is that they're vanilla midgets, all they do is fucking acrobatics, Gallagher is nothing like that. He's not doing flips. He's not fucking doing pl planches over the top rope. He's not doing 450 splashes. He is strictly ground-based. And he's got a unique look that is different than anybody else. In a day and age where people are crying for characters to be made, there's no character with any of these guys. Gallagher has character. Gallagher needs to be signed for the Cruiserweight division. No question. And I hope I see more of him. And I was very disappointed that Akira Tozawa um, pretty much advanced here. I don't have a problem with it. I think, he's, I think he, might, he might actually go to the finals. You know, I mean, who the fuck knows, but... Akira Tozawa, uh, Daniel Bryan says, has the prettiest German suplex in the business. Might very well be true. Is it better than Brock Lesnar's suplexes? Probably not. Is it the prettiest? Yes, without question. Akira Tozawa wins German suplex, 11 minutes and 38 seconds. Deadlift German suplex. Gallagher tried to block it so desperately, holding on to Tozawa's leg, but it was not enough, and he crashed with the mat. One, two, three. Akira Tozawa with a bridging German suplex for the win. Ho, ho, loon! I'm going to comment on Twitter, and I've been trying to think about what, you know, ho, ho, loon looks so, he, he looks like somebody. I couldn't put my fucking tongue on him. I, I couldn't put my finger on him. And I'm looking at him, and I'm looking at him tonight, and I'm like, you know who he looks like? He looks like a mixture of a Chinese, Leafy is here, and the one, two, three kid. Now, call me a goon for that type of comparison, but he's got the hairstyle like Leafy. You know, he's got similar features to Leafy's face, and he reminds me of the one, two, three kid in size and stature and just the way he, you know, he, he moves in the ring. That's just me. Call me a goon if you want. That's just the way uh, I seen him and described him to everybody on Twitter tonight. No M. Dar. Listen, I respect everybody's opinion here. When we're talking about the Cruiserweight Classic, a lot of you guys said, you know, J.D., he had a great match with Jay Lethal in What Culture Pro Wrestling. From what I see tonight, and I haven't watched that match yet, I believe you guys it was a great match. I, I believe the crowd was rabid and hungry, and they were fucking going crazy for that match. You know, it's Jay Lethal, why the fuck not? But the way Noam Dar is being presented on the Cruiserweight Classic, mixed with the crowd reactions, it's, it's half okay and then half silent. I don't see what the grand appeal is with Noam Dar. I, I really don't. You know, call me a goon right now. From what I see, I believe you guys that he's, he's a great talent. He's 22 years old. It might be his age. But I am not seeing what everybody else is talking about when it comes to Noam Dar. I'm sorry. For the first two matches that he's fought in this tournament, I just feel bored. I just feel bored. He doesn't have any personality to me. I just feel like he has no personality. Ho Ho Loon had more of a personality to me, you know? Guys like Noam Dar, to me, if someone like that won the tournament, I would be very displeased. He has absolutely nothing that makes him stand out. And I might be wrong about that, but I just don't see it yet. I'm willing to give him a chance because he's not bad in the ring. He's not as great as everybody says he is, and he might very well be better than what I'm making him out to be. I just don't see it yet. Or I have not seen it in this Cruiserweight Classic. Maybe it's about, you know, to come through when he finally has some better competition. You know, you can't really judge someone like Noam Dar when everybody's saying he's great based on a match with Ho Ho Loon and one of the fucking Bollywood boys. Not going to get it done. Maybe if he has the competition amped up a little bit, maybe I'd be a little bit more impressed. But right now, I'm not seeing what everybody's fucking going crazy about with Noam Dar. He wins. Ho Ho Loon loses. Knee bar. Noam Dar advances. And that is pretty much it for Noam Dar. Really nothing special. Kind of bored me a little bit, but I'm willing to give this guy a chance. I'm hoping to see what everybody else is seeing when it comes to Noam Dar. Tony Nese. I said this before this match took place. Tony Nese is one of my odds-on favorite to win this tournament. Obviously, you got your Ibushis and your fucking Rich Swans and your Akira Tozawas. And you got your Brian Kendricks, which he fought Brian Kendrick tonight. TJ Perkins might be my new favorite now. But Tony Nese going into this, he's got the look, he's got the athleticism, he's a fucking total athlete, like they've been saying. Tony Nese is a fucking beast. He doesn't even remind me of a cruiserweight at all. And he went against Flying Brian. 
Brian Kendrick, the real Brian Kendrick, USA versus USA here, started off very, very physical to the point where I honestly thought within the first three minutes of this match that Brian Kendrick was going to get squashed. I, I really thought. And I don't know why I thought that, but I did. Tony Nese is fucking powerful. He can fly with the best of them, and if you want to fucking brawl and get physical, he can do that as well. Tony Nese, in the end here, loses. He falls to flying Brian. Brian Kendrick wins. Bully choke. And Tony Nese evaded the bully choke on more than one occasion. In the end, it was the bully choke in which he tapped out very fast. Because Tony Nese went for a fucking 450 splash. Missed. Kendrick seen an opening. Gave him the bully choke. And without any hesitation at all, Tony Nese tapped out. This was a great match. 15 minutes. Very worthy of a main event spot for week 6 on the Cruiserweight Classic. Okay? Definitely the best match of the night. I don't think it was the best decision at all. I think Tony Nese has more to offer than Brian Kendrick does. I know Brian Kendrick is 38 years old. And I love the line that Brian Kendrick said tonight. 38-year-old Brian Kendrick, you know, is smarter than 39-year-old Brian Kendrick. 39-year-old Brian, 39 Brian Kendrick might not even see this opportunity, you know. 38-year-old Brian Kendrick has to seize this opportunity now, you know. So, Brian Kendrick advances. And I know everybody's going to go crazy with this. He advances, and it might very well be the last time we see Brian Kendrick in this tournament. Next time he fights may, may very well be the last time we see him fight in this tournament. Because he's going one-on-one -on -one with Kota Ibushi. Holy shit. I know a lot of people are fucking going to go crazy over this match. I'm looking forward to it, especially after the first two performances that Kota Ibushi has, has given us in this tournament. Once again, once against uh, Sean Maluda, and then obviously with Cedric Alexander, but... This was a great match, man. It had, it had literally everything. The struggle of Brian Kendrick to overcome the more powerful Tony Nese. You know, Brian Kendrick was being dominated early on. You know, you had a Falcon Arrow by Tony Nese that could have easily won the match. He gets a close near fall with that. You know, Brian Kendrick using sly maneuvers, using the ring to his advantage. At one point, Tony Nese got his arm stuck in the turnbuckle. And then Brian Kendrick, you know, obviously reaped the benefits out of that. Bully choke, Nese, pump handle. Uh, into a sit-down powerbomb. Nice is getting frustrated. You see the fucking frustration building on Tony Nice that he couldn't put away Brian Kendrick. Obviously, Kendrick ends up winning with a bully choke after a failed 450 attempt, 450 splash off the top rope. Brian Kendrick advances to face Kota Ibushi in the Elite Eight. Unbelievable night. Great night of fucking wrestling. NXT was great with the hype and build for NXT TakeOver. Cruiserweight Classic is just continuing to impress week after week. Tony Nice needs to be signed. To the Cruiserweight Classic. Absolute, or well, the Cruiserweight Division. Coming out of the Cruiserweight Classic. No question. Guys like Tony Nese, Brian Kendrick, Tajiri, and literally everybody you're seeing in the second round is going to make the Cruiserweight Division on Monday Night Raw the most must-see thing on Monday Night Raw. Every single week. WWE has to do these guys right. Tony Nese needs to be signed. He's too good not to be signed. And it was a great night, man. I got no complaints at all. Obviously, we got Monday Night Raw and SmackDown. Shit shows. We always look forward to Wednesday to lift our spirits, and that's exactly what they did tonight and do every single Wednesday, man. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, hit that thumbs up. Let me know what you're thinking down below of the Cruiserweight Classic and tonight's surprising winners, man. There were some surprising winners here tonight. I didn't think Tony Nese was going to lose. I didn't think, um, I, I didn't think uh, Jack Gallagher was going to lose. So it was pretty surprising to me, man. Let me know what you guys think down below. If you did, hit that thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. And check out my NXT preview and predictions. Make sure you guys tune in to Off The Script on Friday. Make sure you guys check out that Sami Zayn versus Seth Rollins, WWE 2K16, Road to 2K17, King of the Ring. Plus so much more. Uh, I got so much more content coming for SummerSlam weekend, man. It's going to be fucking crazy. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. I'm JD. Thank you guys for watching. And I'll see you guys right back here for Off The Script on Friday with SummerSlam preview and predictions. I'll talk to you later.